thousand times we uncaged. Welcome to Topple Uncaged. I'm Steve Topple and you're locked on to the UK's hottest politics and music podcast. Each week, I bring you the rawest takes on the big stories making the news, always joined by a very special guest. Then, I pleasure your mind, body and soul with the freshest, most banging international music going. Uncaged. Regular listeners to this podcast will know that some of my favourite artists are invariably female. And trust when I say that my guest on this week's show is going to the very, 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 very top of that list. She is a powerhousing vocalist, a powerhousing songwriter, who is currently working with a powerhousing producer on her first full project. My, my sound engineer, DJ Paul, said that this producer only picks the toughest female artists, and this lady is no exception to that rule. Lyrically fire, vocally sublime, the kind of voice that gives you goosebumps when you listen to her. I think 2019 is going to be the year she blows up, and and I better just add as well, she's currently on tour with a certain um, Ms. Lauren Hill. I'm extremely excited to have her on the podcast. This has been a few months in the making, actually, but we finally have her here on Top Line Cage. It's a real treat. It is the fantastic, the sublime Tara Harrison. Tara, thank you so much for coming on. I'm very, 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 very excited. Thank you for having me, Stephen. Wow, what an introduction. I'm flattered. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> it's all true. It's all true. We'll, we'll get into that later. Um, it is a real treat to have you on. So, as I said in the introduction, you are you are currently on tour with a certain Miss Lauren Hill, and you've, you've done backing for her for several years now, actually. I mean, you're a singer-songwriter yourself, and she is just such a... Uh, Oh, inspirational talent and such a diverse and such a clever and astute artist it must be so enriching for you to work with someone like that no absolutely i i went from listening and knowing the miseducation um of lauren hill inside and out to having to perform it you know on a different level and in so many different styles as well um it is certainly enriching to work with Ms. Hill. She is uh, creatively a genius in her own right. Lyrically um, has always been an inspiration for me because she really puts forth the message and she's been able to touch upon so many subjects. You know, when you listen to The Miseducation of Lauren Hill, it's like nothing is like the other. She literally touches on a different subject on every song from music to love to, you know, the, the what's happening in these streets, you know. Um, so personally and professionally, it's been an amazing, amazing journey to be able to work with one of your, your idols, you know? I can imagine. It would be like me working with Mariah Carey. There we go. Yes. <laughs> but- I love Mariah Carey. Yeah. That's another story for another podcast anyway. Absolutely. <laughs> it must be amazing because, I mean, the miseducation of of was such a groundbreaking album i mean i was i was sort of a late teenager when it came out and it just blew my mind musically and lyrically um what a what a stunning project it was i mean it must it must be absolutely awesome to work with her but i have to say you are pretty awesome in your own right i mean thank you you are We'll, we'll talk about the first track you released this year in a little while but your musical kind of background i did i did have a little giggle to myself because i i was reading up on you and your kind of musical journey um tara started when you were three um doing an impromptu little um performance <laughs> if you like for shoppers in macy's while your mum's back was turned now i mean i think most people start singing in the shower but you, you took a world famous <laughs> department store and decided to start singing there i mean how how have you developed as an artist because you you started obviously singing obviously from a young age and it progressed from there what was your musical upbringing like as it were well i started i think the macy's moment was so epic just because (laughs) i think that's when they realized like i could totally sing um and so that was when everyone kind of took notice that i wasn't just like hollering all the time you know okay this child can actually sing and she knows all the songs to this whitney houston all excuse me all the lyrics to this whitney houston song 
Um, so I would say that I've been singing since I've been talking, pretty much. Um, and I was really good, as you can see from the Macy's, as you just told from the Macy's moment, that I was really good at finding my stage, really, wherever it was. That kind of continued on from there. You know, I was never afraid to sing out loud if somebody told me to sing a song, or I was never afraid to step on somebody's two steps and just sing there, too, because it, it seemed like a stage, you know? Um, but from there, my parents were really, really amazing at honing my craft. You know, they were always supportive of it. And they never pushed me to do anything that I didn't want to do. But they always introduced really, really good environments for me to, you know, make sure that I got to do what I really, really liked. And to develop, you know, to really, really hone my craft, to develop my voice. Um, so, I mean, I did school plays. I did choirs, both in church and in school. You know, I did a few talent shows, and probably when I did a talent show when I was 13, that's when it was like, okay, let's enter her into the professional world, you know? So at the age of 14, I actually signed a production deal uh, with a really dope songwriter and producer, and we just kind of started the open mic circuit. At that time, you know, I lived in Long Island, which is about 45 minutes from New York City, and... We the, the biggest thing at that point to get signed was the open mic circuit. You know, like at the open mic, it was filled with executives and they were all looking for new talent, old talent, different talent, something unique. Like, you know, for me, my uniqueness in those environments was the fact that I was young. I was 14. Most of these places I wasn't even supposed to be in. My mom was my manager. You know, my very first experience, my cousin was the assistant manager. <laughs> at this place that no longer exists in New York City called Chaz and Wilson's. And um, she was the assistant manager, and I guess she just worked it out. Like, listen, my cousin's coming. She's going to sing on this open mic, which used to be broadcast on um, KISS FM at that time, which is a really dope R&B station at that time. Um, and I just did it. And that's what landed me in my production deal. And from there, I just kind of, like, went through the open mics all through New York City. You know, I used to perform at, like, Soul Cafe, and uh, there was another one, Ashford and Simpson's place. We had a really great open mic. And you always, at the end of the night, I always had executives to talk to. I always had my manager and my production team there on site. And that's really, really how it started, you know. And from there, I just got to, uh, you know, basically get in an audition for the majors, you know, after cutting a couple demos and taking a few, you know, lessons, you know. I, I have to say, I, I will ask you this, because when, when I was sort of reading your, your backstory, it did stand out for me about you doing open mic nights at such a young age. I mean, were you... Because I, I took music lessons when I was a child, and um, I think when, you, when you're that age, you kind of... You don't quite realise what you're doing, I suppose, and you're not so intimidated, maybe, as, as you would be if you were a bit older. But how was that, doing that so young and, and having all those sort of music industry executive around you were, were you aware of sort of the magnitude of what you were doing do you think <laughs> I I was I, I, I wish I could totally remember like the first time I ever did it you know so I could describe the feeling to you but for me it was a rush you know it was it was totally a rush it was like okay I can leave my bedroom and go sing for all these people <laughs> absolutely like sure what do you need me to sing you know and I practiced a lot and I perfected the songs that I loved you know Whitney Houston, Mariah Carey, Gladys Knight stuff at that time. Um, and it was, it was really just a great experience. You know, I was 14 when I started, so my mom was literally, like, connected to my right hip um, if any executives came to talk to me or my production team. Pretty much handled everything because I was so young and impressionable, you know. Um, but thank goodness and thank God for my mom and dad who kept me really, really humble during that time and told me to just make sure that I was enjoying the process and you know they didn't make me feel too pressured about anything. Everyone was really supportive. I had family always coming out to the open mics. You know, it was an awesome time really. No, absolutely. And 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 thank goodness that your parents did do it because you are here now and you are a stunning artist. I'm so you dropped sort of Mariah thank Carey you. and you dropped Mariah Carey and Gladys Knight. I'd love <laughs> to hear you track tackle some of their songs good grief that'd be amazing but you are you are becoming a such an accomplished artist already and yet uh, 
I get a feeling about artists and I, I, I have quite a few of them on my show. My, my girlfriend always moans at me because she's like, you always really praise every musician you have on. And I'm like, well, I only have musicians who I listen to. And I think, wow, they are amazing. <laughs> and I just know that, that, that you are a real talent. You can tell. And you can tell from the first track you dropped this year, which was PSA, um, Public Service Announcement. I mean, it was this brilliant track it it, it it kind of had reggae sensibilities but it also threw me back to the kind of dub wise sound but yet you made it extremely extremely progressive with that and it, it, it sounded very much sort of 21st century bang up to date um and then this huge sort of conscious element with the lyrics as well i mean you're you're a singer and a songwriter and the, the track was just fire it was absolutely brilliant Thank um you. how that track as an example how did the how does the process of composing a track come about do you, do you base it do you get a rhythm first do you have an idea for a theme for a song what's, what's your creative process like as it were I'm, I'm always interested um it usually starts with uh something that i'm humming you know whether i have the track or not like i have like in my phone my all of my notes are like me humming like some sort of melody you know and somehow i memorize them and when i hear a track a lot of times I'll just go to the phone and be like, oh, I think I have a melody for this, you know. And from there, it's really the track that does a lot of the inspiration, you know. Um, it's really the track that does a lot of the inspiration from the drums to even the way that it's set up. You know, I kind of listen to the track and that helps me set up how I'm going to write it. You know, so whether that means we're going to do verse hook, verse pre-hook hook whether there's going to be a bridge included or whether it's important for an instrumental section to be there, you know, it, it, instead it all starts with the track for me. Um, yeah. No, and it shows. I mean, and it, it's, it's such a great track, and it, it it kind of blew up a fair bit over here. Actually, it was on um, BBC One Extra's playlist. Yes, thank you. No, no, I heard. That's the first time I heard it was on um, Dave Rodigan's um, One Extra Reggae Show, and I was just like, yes. "Who is this That's singer?" The first time yeah no and uh, i was just like who is this and and here you are and of course it was produced by legendary producer rory stone love um i mean I, again i was chatting to um another female singer zia benjamin a few weeks ago who's also working with rory um i mean he's just epic how is it working with him he's he's, just, he's fantastic rory is is notably a leader in, I mean, arguably the most influential sound that came out of Jamaica, Stone Love, you know, Stone Love movement. And um, I'm honored to work with someone who has toured the world as much as he has as a, as, as a representative of Jamaica specifically. You know, he shifted from selector now to producer and he just kind of used all of that knowledge all of his musical knowledge, all of his experience all over the world, and really, really puts it into these, these uh, tracks that he makes, this music that he makes. You know, um, that's what I really appreciate about, him, appreciate about him. And as you probably know, Rory specializes in dub. So, you know, that's, that's definitely where uh, Black Dub, that's where it comes from. That's where this whole project that he and I, you know, ended up collaborating on comes from. Um, I'm not, I, it's, I'm not necessarily, it's for me, it was about the message and it could have, it, reggae music and this style in which Rory has is pretty much what I use to express this specific message. You know, for me, I'm, I'm very, very diverse in my genres. So, but for me, this specific project Reggae was the only way to say what I had to say in this one, you know. And that shows in PSA. I mean, there's a bit, there's, there's sort of a standout um, few words for me was when you say, I won't compromise myself to gain public favour. I mean, it, how important is it to make your music conscious? As you say, you, you have a message to get across. Is, do, is that kind of paramount over the music for you or is it an equal balance? So the reason I ask that is because I, I was chatting to a brilliant um, UK rapper who's, who goes by the name of Loki quite a while ago. Um, and he's, his music is extremely 
extremely, extremely conscious. But he was saying that he's he. It's important for him to strike a balance between people wanting to listen to a track for its musical content, but also getting a a message out there. I mean, is, is making your music conscious and getting your message across what d- drives you, as it were, or is it is it a combination of that and the musicality of what you do? It's always. It always starts off conscious, you know what I mean? And then right after that, it's really, really important to make sure that the music hits with that consciousness. So I'd say that there's a great balance there, um, you know, between the two. And you've st- and this is the thing with PSA. I mean, the balance is struck perfectly. It's an absolute banger of a track, um, but it's it, it's also d- deep rooted in very important messages. I'd uh, urge everyone to go and check it out. It's absolutely brilliant. If you want to take a quick breather, go and get yourself some liquid or other refreshment. Do it now, because me and Tara will be back in a few minutes. So you're working with Rory Stone Love. I want to, we'll move on to the project that you're doing with him in a little while. But what you also do, conversely, is charity work. I've seen you've been a constant supporter of the Rockhouse Foundation, um, and you did a gig for them quite recently, actually. Just tell listeners a bit about what the Rockhouse Foundation does, because, I mean, it's great work that they are doing, um, specifically in Jamaica, isn't it? Yeah, specifically in Jamaica. They started... The Rockhouse Foundation is basically... Um, they are a organization that um, they pretty much like build and modify schools in Jamaica. They started off in the grill. They've not, they've kind of moved to like Sav Lamar now, and I think they're up to like six schools. So they bring in specialists. They were um, the first to to build um, a special needs school on that side of the island. Um, they bring in specialists for you know all sorts of things that. Uh, children of a certain, whether it's where they live, the location that they live in, or, you know, that they may not have the money. It's kind of both of those things. It allows so much more um, into that community because of them, you know. So they're an awesome foundation. Um, They're just really, really cool in the way that they fundraise, and you can always see their work. You know, and they're constantly, constantly working. They're constantly looking for new ways. They're constantly bringing in just like special ways to educate the children of Jamaica, you know. And I just, I really appreciate them. And I'm really, really um, pleased to always be able to mix my message and my music in with um, what they're doing. You know? No, that's excellent. There will be a link in the show notes to what the Rockhouse Foundation are doing because it does look like an absolutely fantastic, fantastic yes. project that you're involved in there. I mean, I want to. I'm going to go off script actually, as I always. Uh, do you know what I do? I always I lay out my questions. Oh, and I good. think, Right, I'm going to ask this, 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 and then I just end up going. No, I want to ask something else now. Yeah. Um, I'm, I'm interested because you're both your parents are Jamaican, aren't they? Um, and but you grew up in um, obviously New York. Would you? say that Jamaican culture has influenced you more with your music than US culture has? Has it been, has it been a bigger part? The reason I ask is because a couple of years ago you, you produced this gorgeous track, Home from Way, Home Away from Home. Absolutely beautiful. All about um, what it's like when you return to Jamaica. It Lyrically, it was absolutely, um, it was beautiful. Really moving and, and touching lyrics when I listened to it. It was, it was extremely well crafted. Um, I'm, I am interested. So has Jamaican culture influenced you more, would you say than sort of growing up in the U.S.? Um, Growing up with two Jamaican parents, you're pretty much still being raised in the Jamaican culture all the time. You know, that was a beautiful thing, whether it was from the food or from the rules or, you know, just being sent to Jamaica all the time. You know, you had a week off from school, you go to Jamaica. You you know, summertime, day after (laughs) school ended, it was like, you're going to Jamaica. Um, so Jamaica has a great influence, not only on my music, but on me personally, you know, um, home away from home. I'm so happy that you've gotten a chance to listen to that track. That's what I call my ode to Jamaica. You know, it's really, uh, how I feel about it. Even now, you know, that I, I live there and, and every time I come home from tour or something, it's just, it's the same feeling every time, you know, but the U S culture, you know, I still went to school every day. You know, and I still was a hip hop kid and all that. So I just and I love pop music and R&B music is my life. And this that's how I grew up, you know. 
So I just had a really, really great balance of the two. You know, I we always had something, whether it's Jamaican culture or Jamaican and, and reggae music, Jamaican music on a whole. Um, I don't want to just say reggae because we have more than that. Um, was always playing in my house. And then, you know, on one floor up was my brother blasting the hip hop. So, and there I was in like the middle floor, like blasting the R&B, you know. So, <laughs> I'm just a mix up of all of it, actually, and it really, really um, it makes me mix up the music. Very much. <laughs> this sounds that sounds like my kind of house to grow up in. Wow, reggae, <laughs> hip hop, and R and B, love it, excellent. <laughs> Now, uh, you're, um, you, you kind of fit in extremely well to a, a growing movement of female artists that's coming out of the kind of revival scene. Um, it's, it, it's really interesting. Again, I was chatting about it with Zia, because um, she's got quite strong opinions on this, that there's, there's a movement of female artists um, who are kind of bunched in with the revival movement, um, but are really actually forming a movement in their own right in terms of that they're sort of smashing the norm surrounding what female art should be in terms of the fact that there's always been this notion that someone's the the queen of a certain genre of music and there's a sort of fight to who's going to be top of their game as it were and and Zia was saying that it's it's not like that at the minute that the, the sort of female artists are working collectively together and I mean there's some great names there's yourself there's Zia um there's Savannah there's um Ray Nicole who I had on who I think is going to be huge this year and of course Coffee in with that mix as well i mean is is that movement something that you're seeing as well this this sort of growing um like i say group and emergence of strong female artists Absolutely. the world is changing you know or the world has changed for that matter and in so many ways that um females we are so unique because we've had to pretty much always claim our own opportunities you know, no one has just given us our opportunities. We always have to go for it. Um, and so what I'm seeing in this, you know, so-called revival movement, which I, I love that name for it, is women are able to provide just like a different kind of expression, whether they sing it softly or whether they sing it aggressively. You know, it's about a certain vulnerability that we have, that we possess. Um, and being able to do that through music and be able to hit is, is important. So it's not only the subject we choose, you know, whether you're singing about love or you're singing about conscious music, you're singing about politics, it's the way in which we specifically as women choose to say it. You know, we just provide a different level of expression, level of expression in this world. You know, this is not a man's world. <laughs> no, absolutely. And I mean, do you think it's it, it's um, perfect timing, as it were? Do you think it's more sort of to do with um, everything that happened with Me Too and um, the, the fact that you know we are in twenty nineteen? Is is it are the stars aligned for this to now be happening, as it were, for women to finally? Because it it is so important. Because I mean, if you look at especially within the music industry, there's so much misogyny and so much um women always playing second fiddle um to to the men and as you say it's such an important movement do you, and, and do you think now is the time for these sort of norms and this misogynistic worldview of women in music to finally be broken i think we've always been a movement you know um but unfortunately underestimated you know um and I think we've always been a movement, but now we're able to just publicize it differently. And for me, the difference as the world is changing is that we're getting more support from the world on a whole, you know, and there's not all these lines of who should like what and what a female should say and how they should say it. And, you know, those lines are, they're blurred. They're completely, they're disappearing off the page. So, um... Yeah, I think the time is now. And I think it's always pretty much been like that. But I just think that, you know, we're getting a different way to see it, whether it's through social media, you know, um, or that, you know, you're hearing more about what's happening and people are able to jump on to these things a lot easier than we used to, you know. No, so I, and I think yeah, you hit the nail on the head there. Actually, so social media has, um, for all its faults, it does have a lot of positives as well, and it, it is playing. 
and is playing a crucial role in this. And and of course, as I said, you fit in deliciously into this whole movement. Now, I, I want to know all about this, please. You've got finally a proper um, project coming out from Rory and yourself this year. Tell me all about that, because I am extremely excited and I cannot wait to hear That's it. That's cool. Thank you. So, Rory Stone Love, Black, Mu- Black Dub Music presents uh, The Lady Lights an EP. And it is Lady Lights an EP. It's um, seven songs, all written by me and all produced by Rory. And it's basically just quality roots and, you know, dub, dub wise tracks, you know, captured all in live instrumentation. And they really just narrate, um, I think, what I, it's like I'm talking in the writing. I was pretty much talking to my 16-year-old self. Um, If I knew what I knew now, you know, if I knew then what I knew now, that's who I was talking to, you know. I was talking to my 16-year-old self, like, girl, let me tell you what's going to (laughs) happen. And these are the things that you need to know. And, you know, so it's really... um, it, although it's 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 uh, named after a song called Lady Lights Up, it really is dedicated to the ladies, you know, women and girls uh, alike. And it's fun, but it's serious at the same time. And I'm very straightforward in the way that I sing it. It deals with, um, you know, in Lady Lights Up, it deals with the opposition that women face when because we smoke weed. You know, I know. God forbid. I mean, (laughs) (laughs) PSA was PSA was like my state of state of the union address. You know, I sang it a certain way. I sang it that way. It was almost like I was giving a speech to um, to an audience of women and girls and was like, hear this. You know, let's all get on the same page about this really quickly and whether you agreed with it or you didn't agree with it you know there was something in there that that made you feel away and so that's what was important in that song for me no I, oh, wow i can't wait for the full ep then do, uh, do we have a release date for that yet please not we do not have a release date for that yet uh, coming very very soon <laughs> very soon i'm going to announce the date very soon <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. I'm very pleased to hear it. I can't wait for that because you are, I mean, as I said in the introduction, lyrically and vocally, you are powerhousing. It's, I mean, the PSA was absolutely stunning and Home Away From Home was gorgeous and I honestly can't wait to hear um, Lady Lighter, the EP, whenever that is going to drop. Tara, it has been such a pleasure to have you on the podcast. It's fascinating chatting to you and as I said, I, I, I think you're going to blow up when this EP drops. It's very, very exciting exciting times to um Thank to be able so to much hear you no it's my absolute pleasure i really appreciate you coming on when so you're still touring with um ms hill at the minute aren't you how long is she on tour for still um we kind of tour you know when it's necessary you know so that would be all the time miss hill's you know the message is really really important to get out at all times you know and uh, so I tour as a background vocalist for her, but just this year I started opening up for her. After I dropped PSA, I started opening up the stage uh, for her. So that's been that's been really dope, and that will happen again in a few weeks, starting in at the end of June. Wow, <laughs> opening for Lauren Hill. Okay, do you get nervous? Uh, the first time I did, you know, it's a very different experience to sing. 10 feet away from the stage and then just be two feet away from the audience and know how to inflict, you know, cause there, there are definitely two different positions that I take um, on the stage each night. And um, it's, it's just two different, it's two different levels of connection with the audience, you know? So that's been a really great experience. And I wouldn't say that I get nervous. Um, I'm, I'm in like singing mode and analyzation mode of the audience for me, the stage is about the message and how it gets to the people. You know, the studio is my creative process. That's about self-care, and that's really about the me, uh, me allowing myself to express myself, you know, but the stage is about the people, 100%. It's about 
how you're emphasizing your words and how you're getting it across to people, who you're looking in the eyes. And, you know, really, I've learned that you have to literally talk to them in between, especially with my message. It's not just about music. It's about, you know, um, creating a stir in people. So it's been a great experience overall. Well, you deserve to be at the front of that stage, Tara, because as I said, you are sensational. It's been such a pleasure to have you on, and I cannot wait for Lazy Lighter to come out for the minute. Tara Harrison, thank you so much for coming on the podcast. Thank you so much for having me, Stephen. It's awesome. You know when you hear a new artist for the first time and you think, wow, she or he is absolutely stunning and you just get a certain feeling about them well tara harrison lived up to all my expectations i truly think she's going to be huge she's such an amazing singer and and lyrically profound deep but on point and here is the track that we discussed in the show it is the one that was released at the start of this year called psa that's public service announcement this is absolutely fantastic here's tara harrison with psa that's when you thought you had me locked in a chamber my consciousness it breaks free from society you didn't realize this girl was a danger you will never take my rights away from me no resolution if there's no constitution no institution shall rule the powers that be sick and tired of your so-called solutions you will never take my rights away from me time to get And that's it. This very special episode of Top Lung Caged is done. I'd like to thank my fantastic guest, the sensational Tara Harrison. Follow her on Twitter. It's at I am Tara Harrison. As always, fun scenes. Thanks to the love of my life, the gorgeous Nicola Jeffrey. Follow her on Twitter. It's at Nicola C. Jeffrey. My man behind the booth, sound engineer, Gap Pauls. Follow him on Twitter. It's at Pauls of the Radio. And my in-house singer, it's Ray Star Music. Follow her on Twitter. It's at Ray underscore Star 113. Thank you to the Canary for uncaging me. I will see you again very soon. Uncaged.